Welcome to the history of life and the age of the earth. There are three things which are absolutely vital for evolution, and though that is heritability, natural selection, and geological time. Of those things, geological time is possibly the hardest for us to get into our brains, to visualise. The last half billion years of life is documented beautifully in the fossil record, but the age of the Earth is 4.56 billion years, and it's almost impossible to comprehend the vastness of this time. I think it's easy for humans to imagine the length of time of a human lifespan. Maybe it's impossible to comprehend what a hundred years feels like, but anything beyond that, and it starts to become very difficult. One of the most common ways for us to do this is to impose the events of the last 4.56 billion years onto the face of a clock. But that still means that the fossil record is only represented by the last few hours and humans only appear in the last few seconds of the last minute of the last hour. So maybe there's a better way for us to picture and see and understand the length of time from the formation of the earth to the present day. And I think that is probably using a journey, a distance that we are able to comprehend and changing um, time, absolute time, into a distance in kilometres, metres, centimetres will help us to understand the vast length of time that the earth has been around. So we're going to travel from Big Ben in the centre of London all the way to my office desk in the present day. And once we do this we can start to ask questions like how far from my desk did humans diverge from chimps? So we'll start our journey and at 3.8 billion years ago or when we arrive in Slough, we find our first fossils of cyanobacteria, which represent the oldest fossil record of life on this planet. We come along the M3 and south of Camberley, almost to Basingstoke, and we get photosynthesis. And this is a remarkably important point in the whole of our history, because this is the time when the um, components of the atmosphere were changed from uh, gases which were quite toxic to us to the 21% uh, oxygen that we know and love today. And this made the evolution of eukaryotic cells possible in Basingstoke. Just north of Winchester, or 900 million years ago, according to molecular clock estimates, we have the emergence of metazoa. But we have to come south of Winchester um, and to within 12 miles of my desk before we get the Cambrian explosion and the emergence of all of the animal phyla that we would begin to recognise and that exists today. As we come further south, we get to roughly Otterbourne golf course and we get the emergence of land plants. This is incredibly important because the invasion of land by plants meant that soils could start to form and when soils start to form then we can have habitats and other animals, other organisms can invade the land as well and at 416 million years we have the first fossilized insects at about 397 million years and about two miles three miles north of Chandler's Ford we have our first tetrapods our first animals with four limbs as we come further south we get to the Asda and we get to the dinosaurs at 220 million years ago as we come further south um, and we come along the M M3 and we're almost at the turn off for Southampton itself we get our first mammals at 200 million years ago at the shell station we have the origin of birds we are now about three miles four miles from um, my desk slightly further south again as we're coming on off of the motorway proper at the roundabout we have the emergence of angiosperms at 140 million years ago Coming along Bassett Avenue, we reach Glen Eyre Hall, and 65 million years ago, we have the extinction of the dinosaurs. At this point, 98.5% of the time since the Earth has formed 
has passed. As we come further down, we end up at uh, the Burgess Road and Burgess Road uh, junction with um, Bassett Avenue. 32 million years ago, we see the emergence of the first monkeys. As we keep coming down um, and we're coming on to the university precinct, we see the emergence of apes, hominoids, at 17.5 million years ago. And at this point now, 99.87% of the time that the Earth, since the Earth was formed has passed. And when we get to the flagpole just outside building 85, this is 6 million years ago, and this is the point when humans diverge from chimps. As we walk up the steps, we come to the um, Ardipithecus, and this is a skeleton which is far more recognisably human-like. And as we come right up to the very door of building 85, we're at 1 million years ago. This is where Homo erectus first left Africa. And this brings us to the very, very recent history of life on Earth. Five metres from my desk, we have anatomically recognisable human skeletons. 81 centimetres from my desk, Neanderthals die out. 27 centimetres from my desk, the last ice age took place at 24 centimetres, we get agriculture. And then at 15 centimetres from our desk, my desk, this is where the Genesis story, the creation story of the Bible is found. And your birth, your lifespan, is represented by the diameter of the lead of a propelling pencil, half a millimetre. So... Why is this important? Why is it so important to understand the vastness of the length of geological time? Well, evolution, the fact that you're sitting here listening to me talking about this, is an unlikely event. And when we have long periods of time, unlikely rare events are more likely to happen. If we look at DNA the mutation rate is extremely low. We only expect one in 100 million chance that a DNA base pair will mutate in any given generation. But humans have 3 billion base pairs, therefore in any generation we can expect 30 base pairs will mutate. In a population of 250,000 humans, there are 7.5 million mutations per generation. Since the chimp-human split of 6 million years ago, um, and assuming that a generation is 25 years, we can assume that every single base pair can have mutated 240 times. This means that the adaptive landscape has been really, really well explored. So, this brings us on now to the history of evolutionary theory. We can understand um, natural selection from a Darwinian point of view. We can understand heritability. And we can understand um, geological timescales. So how does evolution fit into this and the idea of the, uh, of the theory of evolution? Well, the first person to talk about it was Lamarck in 1809, same year as Darwin was born. Darwin published in 1859 in The Origin of Species. Mendel was writing his work on genetics at the same time as all of this in Bruno in what is now the Czech Republic, but he wasn't discovered again until 1900. Haldane made observations in nature, looked at the, looking at the peppered moth in 1920. Then we've got works on the genetical theory of natural selection. We've got experiments on inbreeding and genetic drift. We've got Jobjansky's work, um, the genetics and the origin of species. We've got uh, Mayer and the systematics and the origin of species. And all of these ideas, all of these things feed into morphology, understanding of plants, cell biology, genetics, paleontology, ecology, systematics. They all feed into Huxley's work in 1942, the uh, modern synthesis, which is the reconciliation of Mendelian genetics with natural selection. So, to sum up, we have our heritable variation as explained by Mendel. We have natural selection as explained by Darwin. Some organisms are better suited to the environment and so are more likely to reproduce and pass on their genes. And all together with the ge geological time that we needed, we now have uh, the time for all of these rare events to happen. Thank you.